On the morning of September 7, 2025, the East Bay awoke to the kind of sharp, jarring reminder that California lives in the long shadow of its faults. At a few minutes after nine o'clock, a magnitude 3.2 earthquake struck just north of Pleasanton. The United States Geological Survey measured the shock as originating roughly three miles or about five kilometers from the town center, with a hypocentral depth of nearly eight and a half miles, equivalent to about 14 kilometers beneath the Earth's surface. Though modest in size, the quake was felt broadly indoors, swaying light fixtures and startling residents from Danville to Livermore, from Hayward to smaller Tri-Valley neighborhoods. Several minor aftershocks followed in the hours afterward. A pattern seismologist's note is typical even after moderate events. At first glance, the quake might seem like an ordinary reminder of the Bay Area's restless crust, a tremor too small to do damage and too routine to warrant sustained attention. But what made this shock resonate among seismologists was not its magnitude, but its location. According to preliminary analyses, the quake appears to have occurred near the so-called Pleasanton Fault, a northeast-trending geologic structure along the eastern edge of the Tri-Valley. Yet here lies the conundrum. For decades, geotechnical surveys have questioned whether the Pleasanton Fault even exists as a coherent surface trace. In a 2013 study prepared for the city of Dublin, consultants flatly reported that there was no substantiated evidence for the existence of the inferred Pleasanton Fault. Drillers found no scarps, no clear offset sediments, no visible break in the geologic layering at the surface. And yet, seismological evidence paints a different picture. In the 1970s, a United States Geological Survey study of the Livermore Valley suggested that the Pleasanton Fault is probably seismically active, noting that several small earthquakes appeared to line up with its projected underground trend. The evidence was thin, but enough to keep the possibility alive. This new quake deepens the mystery. Was the September 7th shock truly generated on a buried strand of the Pleasanton Fault, or did it rupture a deeper splay of the neighboring Calavera system? The ambiguity is not academic. If the Pleasanton Strand is real, it may represent an unmapped hazard running directly under populated East Bay suburbs. If it is instead part of the Calaveras system, then it may be a signal of stress migrating across an already complex fault network. The Pleasanton area occupies a tectonic crossroads. To the west, the long and sinuous Calaveras fault runs northward from the hills above San Jose to the agricultural flats near Hollister. To the northwest lies the Hayward Fault, threading through one of the densest corridors of urban California. To the north, the Concord and Green Valley system shadows the inland delta region. Seismologists have long emphasized that these faults do not exist in isolation. A University of California Berkeley study in 2015 used satellite-based INSAR imaging to demonstrate that the Southern Hayward Fault connects directly into the Calaveras system. As lead author Estelle Chaussard summarized, this implies that the two faults could rupture together, producing a significantly larger earthquake than previously estimated. Her team documented 19 years of continuous surface creep on the Hayward Trace, blending into the Calaveras alignment, with swarms of microquakes linking them at depth. The conclusion was stark. The maximum earthquake on a fault scales with its length, and by uniting Hayward with Calaveras, the effective rupture length could increase enough to yield a magnitude in the low 7 range. The United States Geological Survey, in contrast, had previously modeled Hayward and Calaveras as independent systems, assigning roughly 14% probability of a magnitude 6.7 or greater on Hayward in 30 years, and only 7% for Calaveras. If the faults are indeed continuous, those figures may underestimate the true regional hazard. In practical terms, this means that even modest shocks like the Pleasanton magnitude 3.2 can be meaningful. A similar case unfolded earlier this year. On March 19, 2025, a magnitude 3.9 quake rattled Dublin, barely a few miles away. The Geological Survey located its epicentre between the Hayward and Calaveras traces, almost straddling them. 
UC Berkeley seismologist Angie Lux noted that the quake appeared to be accommodating stress between the two systems, hinting that the crust itself may be providing a bridge between the major structures. Whether last spring's Dublin tremor and this September Pleasanton jolt represent separate local events or linked stress transfers is an open question, but experts increasingly suspect that these small quakes could be the way strain migrates from one locked fault to another. The uncertainty grows when considering the possible role of the Pleasanton fault. If it is a genuine strand lying to the east of Calaveras in the Livermore Amador Valley, it could provide another connection point into the wider Bay Area fault web. Some geologists have speculated that it might tie at depth into the San Andreas system through the Mount Diablo thrust or the Green Valley system, though this remains conjecture. What is certain is that earthquakes do not always follow our mapped lines. Southern California offers a cautionary tale. The 1994 Northridge disaster occurred on a blind thrust fault that was virtually unknown before its catastrophic slip. USC geologist James Dolan has long warned that urban regions sit directly atop little-known faults invisible until they rupture. Northern California, despite decades of mapping, remains subject to the same hidden hazard. The 2014 Napa quake, magnitude 6.0, ruptured a previously unmapped strand beneath a residential neighbourhood, buckling asphalt and breaking pipelines, even though surface displacement measured only a few inches. The lesson is clear. The absence of a map trace does not equal the absence of risk. Each of the Bay Area's principal faults carries a distinct history of violence. The Calaveras produced two of the region's most significant 20th-century quakes, the 1911 Morgan Hill event, estimated at magnitude 6.6, .6, and the 1984 Morgan Hill quake at magnitude 6.2. Both involved right lateral strike-slip motion, releasing energy on the order of tens of atomic bombs. Remarkably, it has now been more than a century since Calaveras generated a major rupture of that scale. Seismologists caution that long periods of quiet can allow strain to accumulate to unexpected levels. The Hayward Fault poses an even greater concern. Its last great rupture occurred in October 1868, when a magnitude 6.8 tore through what was then sparsely populated farmland and small towns, toppling chimneys and damaging structures across the East Bay. In its era, the quake was called the Great San Francisco Earthquake, a grim reminder that the city itself was heavily shaken long before the 1906 disaster. Paleoseismic trenching along Hayward has revealed a dozen major quakes of magnitude 6.3 or greater over the past several millennia, with the last five averaging roughly 138 years apart. By 2025, we are already 157 years removed from 1868, meaning the fault is overdue by its own statistical rhythm. UC Berkeley professor Roland Bergman has warned repeatedly that everything we've learned about the Hayward Fault tells us it is ready to produce another large earthquake today. The timing remains unknowable, but the clock is clearly in its late hours. Meanwhile, the Concord and Green Valley system to the north creeps slowly at only 4 to 5 millimetres per year, yet interacts dynamically with its neighbours. It has not experienced a major rupture for several centuries, though in 1955 a magnitude 5.4 Concord quake caused damage in the East Bay. To the south, the central San Andreas at Parkfield and Hollister historically produced magnitude 6 events every few decades. Shocks in 1966, 1983 and 2004 were part of this characteristic earthquake pattern, but it has been unusually quiet since then. Collectively, these absences suggest that strain may be building across multiple strands. The Pleasanton quake, therefore, arrives in the midst of a broader pattern. In the days surrounding September 7th, small earthquakes were recorded across multiple Bay Area fault zones. The Hayward produced a sequence of one to two magnitude tremors near Fremont. On September 5th, just two days before Pleasanton's jolt, a tiny quake occurred on the Green Valley Fault. On May 30th, a magnitude 3.2 struck Concord, rattling the Northeast Bay. While none of these events alone poses a threat, together they suggest a regional network of faults experiencing elevated stress. 
Seismologists caution that such clusters do not necessarily presage a large quake, but they cannot be dismissed. In Southern California, sequences of minor tremors have often preceded significant ruptures as stress migrates through the spiderweb of faults. Northern California could be entering a similar phase. What makes the September 7th Pleasanton tremor notable is precisely this context. Its magnitude was small, but its timing and placement intersect with ongoing debates about Bay Area tectonics. Was it on the Pleasanton Fault, whose existence some geologists still doubt? Was it on a deeper splay of Calaveras, hinting at stress release after more than a century of silence? Was it a bridge event between Hayward and Calaveras, similar to March's Dublin quake? Or was it simply one more piece in the larger puzzle of a restless crust approaching another round of major quakes? The answers remain elusive, but the questions themselves highlight the stakes. In examining the September 7th Pleasanton earthquake, one cannot ignore the broader statewide context. California is never entirely still, but patterns matter, and lately the patterns have grown more conspicuous. Over the past several years, seismologists have noted what they describe as surges in minor seismicity along the length of the West Coast. Northern California's Bay Area is only one arena. To the south, near Ridgecrest in the Mojave Desert, a swarm of quakes in July 2019 culminated in a magnitude 7.1 rupture. That sequence began with smaller foreshocks in the magnitude 4 range, reminders that even the smallest tremors can herald larger failures. In Oregon and Washington, deep tremor episodes beneath the Cascadia subduction zone recur every few months, slipping silently, but reminding researchers that one of the largest seismic hazards in North America remains locked and poised offshore. Seismologists emphasize that these events, while separated geographically, are linked by the fundamental physics of plate tectonics. The Pacific plate grinds inexorably northwestward against the North American plate, at a rate of about two inches per year, roughly five centimeters annually. Over decades, the stress accumulates and it must be released. Fault systems from the San Andreas to Hayward to Pleasanton act as pressure valves. When multiple valves begin to creak open at once, as seen in the present moment, the concern naturally rises. California has learned through bitter experience that damage scales not only with magnitude, but also with geography. The Hayward Fault alone runs directly beneath some of the most densely populated cities in Northern California, including Oakland, Berkeley, Hayward itself, and Fremont. A rupture there would place more than two million people in immediate shaking zones. A joint hayward Calaveras rupture could expose an even wider swath of the Bay Area, potentially shaking from San Jose through Concord in one sustained burst. United States Geological Survey scenarios have long warned that a repeat of the 1868 Hayward quake in modern times could cause tens of billions of dollars in damage, displace hundreds of thousands of residents, and cripple regional infrastructure. The infrastructure vulnerabilities are not theoretical. Bay Area rapid transit tunnels cross the Hayward Fault. Major freeways such as Interstate 80, Interstate 580, and Interstate 88 intersect fault traces. Gas pipelines and water mains lie buried across lines of weakness. During the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, a magnitude 6.9 on the San Andreas system, portions of the Bay Bridge collapsed and the Cypress Freeway viaduct pancaked, killing 42 people. That quake originated more than 50 miles south of San Francisco, a similarly sized rupture directly beneath the East Bay could be far more devastating. What compounds the concern is that many residents underestimate the hazard posed by smaller quakes. The September Pleasanton shock produced no damage, but it delivered a clear message. The ground here is active and the stress is real. Scientists consistently caution that small earthquakes do not reduce the likelihood of a large one. In fact, they can sometimes increase stress on neighboring segments. The Hayward Fault, overdue by its statistical cycle, is now being bracketed by small quakes to its north, south and east. The Calaveras, quiet for over a century, has shown bridging events that may signal reloading. 
The Concord Green Valley and San Andreas systems have stirred as well. It is the convergence of all these signals that makes the current period noteworthy. For seismologists, the challenge is communicating uncertainty. Earthquakes cannot be predicted with precision. No one can state that the Pleasanton quake was a foreshock, nor can they rule out that possibility. But the odds of a large quake in the coming decades are undeniable. California's own Uniform California Earthquake Rupture Forecast estimates a 72% chance of at least one magnitude 6.7 or greater quake striking the Bay Area within 30 years. Those odds are not abstract, they represent the lived risk of a generation. The investigative trail also leads into questions of public preparedness. Despite decades of research and public campaigns, surveys show that many Bay Area households still lack earthquake kits, do not have secured heavy furniture and remain unaware of the specific risks posed by their local faults. Emergency managers emphasize that recovery from a large quake may take weeks if not months. Power outages, water shortages and blocked roads are all anticipated in scenarios. After the Loma Prieta shock, some areas of Santa Cruz and Oakland took years to rebuild. In the modern Bay Area, with its tech economy, dense housing and fragile transportation networks, the impacts could ripple globally. Urban planners and geotechnical engineers quietly warn of another dimension, unrecognized faults beneath city cores. Just as the Napa 2014 quake revealed a hidden strand, so too might the Pleasanton quake be whispering of an unmapped hazard beneath the East Bay suburbs. James Dolan's cautionary words about Los Angeles a city plopped on top of little-known urban faults, apply equally here. Mapping has improved, but the earth holds secrets. When they are revealed, it is often too late. In considering the September 7th quake, one must also weigh the psychological element. Californians live with earthquakes as a background condition. Many dismiss small jolts as routine, part of the price of the climate and geography. But when tremors begin to cluster, when they occur near debated or hidden faults, when they strike within the statistical overdue window of major systems, the narrative shifts. The Pleasanton quake is part of that shift. Whether the Pleasanton strand is real or merely a phantom in the crust, the evidence converges on one fact. The Bay Area fault network is interconnected and highly stressed. The Hayward, the Calaveras, the Concord Green Valley, the San Andreas, all are capable of producing destructive quakes. When multiple segments interact, the potential magnitudes rise dramatically. The September 7th tremor, insignificant in isolation, fits into a larger puzzle of a restless region edging toward release. For the investigative reporter, the question becomes, how do we convey urgency without inciting panic? Experts counsel realism. The odds of a major quake in the coming days remain low, but the odds over years are high. Preparedness is not optional. The Pleasanton event, a 3.2 jolt beneath quiet suburbs, is a reminder to secure homes, reinforce infrastructure, and build resilience now, not later. And so, the Pleasanton quake may be remembered not for its shaking but for its symbolism, a minor event that illuminated major fault lines, both geological and social. A moment when the science warned us yet again that the Bay Area sits atop a loaded system overdue for release, interconnected in ways more complex than our maps once suggested. A story where a town's quiet morning jolt becomes a regional alarm bell. The investigative trail leads to one final note. Earthquakes are not isolated calamities, but part of cycles. They are the punctuation in California's geologic story. The Pleasanton shock was a comma, not a period. The sentence is unfinished. What comes next depends on forces far beneath our feet, forces building silently and invisibly. But what comes after that depends on us, on whether we heed the warning, strengthen our communities, and prepare for the inevitable. If you found this analysis useful and believe more people should be paying attention to these signals, then make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget to tap that hype icon to push this report into a larger audience because awareness spreads resilience and resilience saves lives.